Okay. Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, special uh, webinar. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by uh, STEM Matters and uh, Young Professional Society. Uh, the aim of the uh, Young Professional Society is to focus on communication and leadership, and uh, we work closely with STEM Matters on uh, in innovation. Both of these organizations, they've been set up in order to try and maximize the potential of young people. So we want to give them the leadership skills, the communication skills, and uh, also be well-versed in uh, creativity and innovation. So along with their technical education, they can uh, progress rapidly in their career and become future leaders. And uh, also, they will be able to maybe shape the future and make this world a better place for everybody to uh, live. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Ranjeva Balasani from the University of Oxford, who I've known for a long time since he was a, probably a little kid. So uh, he's going to talk about his life at Oxford at the moment and how he managed to get there and give you some uh, ideas and inspiration and stories about his life and inspire you so hopefully more of our community can get into these highly prestigious universities. So without any further ado, let me introduce Ranjabar. Would you like to say a few words about yourself and your background, Ranjabar? Yeah, um, thank you ever so much. Thank you for having me and inviting me. Um, basically, my name is Ranjabar Sani. I am uh, default uh, PhD candidate at the University of Oxford in cybersecurity. I did my undergrad, well, I, I started my undergrad in medicine uh, at the University of Aberdeen, but um, two years later, I changed my career to computer science when the first hacking course was permitted in the UK at the University of Coventry. And then um, later, I went back there to do my master's. Um, uh, to, so basically, I was I was intending to prepare a presentation, and then um, I was talking to a friend of mine from Oxford. He's one of the admins, and I was telling him that I was going to do a presentation. And he, he said it would be much better if you just share your life story and how you got here, because he's very close. And I thought actually that would be a better idea. So, so uh, I'm going to go right into it without having uh, presented like having prepared the presentation. Um, I came to the UK as an asylum seeker in uh, 1999, on 7th of Fe uh, February. Can, we say, can I just interrupt you? Can you start a little, little bit earlier, what life was like when you were a child? In, uh... Oh, okay. So, so I, I, I'm a Kurd. I come from Iraq. I come from Kurdistan of Iraq. So we had an interesting childhood. Um, by, the, by the age of 15, 17, I was out in and out of prison for two to three times, uh, purely for political reasons and none of my own. Obviously, before when I was five years of age, I did not have any political activities. Um, I was not um, uh, campaigning for better that night diapers. Uh, it was my dad's activities that, that got us into trouble uh, with the regime at the time uh, because he was a freedom fighter and the regime couldn't get hold of the freedom fighters. So he would go and arrest the families. And um, that was the case. Um, and and, and as, as I started uh, from primary school, I had a very shaky education because of my dad's activities. We were from school to school, from household to household. Often we would try to hide. Um, I, I had to learn from a very young age to basically deceive people about my father's uh, work. And my father was a freedom fighter in the mountains and my teachers would tell me, where is your father? What does your father do? In parents meeting, they would tell me, why is your father not coming? And each time I had to get creative and, and say different things. Um, that's, that's how it all started. Um, in 88, uh, I went to visit my father and this is the first time I got, uh, the first time I got exposed to chemical weapon attack um, and where I saw dead people. Uh, it was it was it was the law, it was the norm at the time to be honest for, for within my community. Um, long like story a, short, from these challenges, you obviously that situation is well, challenging for everybody. 
what are the main lessons did you learn and who were your major influences? I, 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 don't, I don't want to make this kind of spiritual, but to be perfectly honest, uh, at a very young age, I, I kept questioning myself, why me? You know, why, why do I have to go to prison from the age of five? Why do I have to see chemical weapon attack when I'm four or five? And, and these, these, these were resonating questions that, that they, they came with me. For one, I'm a true believer in, in the fact that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true believer of that because whatever life threw at me and, and, and the fact that I got up, uh, Rocco Balboa has a, has a nice uh, saying, he says, it doesn't matter how hard you punch. Uh, what matters is that how hard you can get punched and get back on your feet. So it doesn't matter what, how strong you think you are, what well, that really matters at the end of the day, like when you, when you face a problem and it knocks you down or knocks you out, how quickly can you get back on your feet and keep on going? Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. So all these experiences I had in life, you know, um, all, the, all the stuff I had in, in my childhood kind of prepared me to be, to be persistent and, and, and not giving up later on. And that's what got me to where I am. And I'm, I'm and it's, it is still with me when I've got my other goals or, or other dreams to achieve. So with that, like I, I, had, I had these resonating questions, like why me, you know, why did I, why did this happen to me? Why not somebody else, wish it wasn't me. And then later on, I realized all these were some sort of, I can see them as grand, a, a grand scheme, a plan to prepare me for later. Uh, for one, uh, once I came to the UK and claimed asylum, and I told them about my childhood and, and how I got arrested and, went, and, and got tortured and whatnot, that ensured that I got granted a refugee status very quickly. Uh, and that helped me to get onto the education track. And unfortunately, lots of asylum seekers that come to the UK and they don't get granted a, side, a, a refugee status for like four, five, six years. Then for four, four five, six years, they don't get to go into education, at which point, you know, they might, they might be demotivated to go back into education and continue following a, a, an academic or educational career path. But luckily, those things that happened to me ensured that I got a, a, a refugee status very quickly. So that in itself helped me. Um, Did you think when you were younger, uh, you know, in your back home that you'd be ever at Oxford University? What was your aims and ambitions mm -hmm. at that time? To, to be honest, I mean, because I felt I felt I had to prove myself uh, because I wanted to change things from early on. I worked really hard when it came to school. I wouldn't say like I was the smartest, but I, I would definitely say I was the most hardworking student in the class when I was when I was younger. Um, and, and it was it was sheer hard work, the sweats and tears that that. Uh, made me excel in, in, in education. So no, I did not think I was, I was going to make it to Oxford. In fact, I did not think for a moment that I was going to study outside of Kurdistan um, for a second. That, that, that's not what kind of, but as, as things happened, the last time I was in prison, it was really unbearable. I was in there for three months and I got tortured to a point of like falling on conscience. Um, that's when you know I, I thought, okay, that's it. I can't stand here uh, through bribery and whatnot. Like you know, they got me out of prison and I headed to the UK, where I claimed asylum and, and I became a refugee there. So, so with, with these, uh, I, I did not think I was going to study in the UK. In fact, my English was really poor. Um, when I came to the UK, I remember I, I went to Burnish High School, uh, a school, a previous. The year to the one that I got in, in 1998, a student was stabbed to death, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, somebody was stabbed, I'm not sure if he was to death, but I think he was to death at Burnage High School. And prior to that, there were a couple, two more stabbings. Um, it was all boys school, uh, public school. Uh, did not have a good reputation at the time. Uh, so, and when I came to the Burnage High School, there was a careers advisor that we all had to go to. Uh, I couldn't speak much much English at the time, and we had to go and see him. And there was only one other Kurdish boy in the school, so he came with me translating. And I remember going to my teacher. Uh, she told me like, "What would you like to become?" And I said, "I want to go to med school." So she told me, "Well, if not med school, then what else?" I said, "Well, just med school, nothing else." And then um, she smiled. She goes, "Look, your English is not so good. Med school might be really difficult." 
out of 3,000 applicants that have speak perfect English, only 300 people get into uh, med school, uh, for instance, in Manchester University. So how about you think about something else? I was like, no, just med school, nothing else. And, and this is me saying it in Kurdish, not even in English, because I could not speak much English at the time. Um, so she thought I was like, I was out of my head and, and, and I wasn't making a lot of sense. And she did the sensible thing saying, look, you know what, why don't you go home, think about it. Then if you think of something else, come back to me. I was like, sure, yeah, but I don't think I'm gonna think of anything. I'll just med school, nothing else. What gave you the confidence to say, look, yeah, I come from a poor kind of background in terms of obviously a deprived environment that you could aim so high and get into medical school. Where, where did that confidence come from? To be perfectly honest, Professor, it was, it was purely uh, the, the, the idea that if you persist in anything in life, you're going to get there. Uh, I, I, I held that belief from, from very early on. I thought if you are persistent, it doesn't matter what it is that you are persistent with, you will get there eventually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who's spiritual, I'm somebody who believes in religion, but I don't want to bring religion into this particular seminar or webinar. But um, and, and there's a big part of that in my life. Throughout my life, that has been a huge part that has moved, like got me to move on. Um, despite of what a lot of people might believe, if it wasn't for that, there's been many times in life I have thought, you know, just give up on life altogether. Uh, but the spiritual side or the religious side have, have kept me going believing in, in, in another power that is out there watching me, putting me through different tests. Uh, it's, it's what got me to, to where I am, to be honest. This is a humongous part of me that I cannot kind of hide or deny or, or mask. Um, so people respond, to, people respond to stress in different ways. Yeah, so some people, when they get stressed out, they've got lots of pressure, they kind of cave in, yeah, and they kind of can't perform. Others, they kind of thrive on stress what advice would you give to youngsters about the differences well, in attitude? The, the, the way I see it, Professor, it doesn't matter how bad things are, it is still good. Mm. Like, okay, if I, if I lose all my money today and you know, my, my house gets knocked down with an earthquake, I still got my limbs, my eye, my nose, my mouth. I've still got things going for me. It's not end of the road. And through persistence, I can always make up whatever it is gone. I can always make it again. I can always rebuild whatever I lose. It's never, ever end of the line. There is always, you can always start fresh. And you never do start fresh, the truth is, because it doesn't matter what experiences you gain or what uh, path you take, it's an experience. It might be a good one or a bad one, but it's an experience. And you will learn from that experience. So when you're starting again, you're really not starting fresh. You're not starting from zero. You're starting 10 steps or 20 steps ahead. And then you start from there, simply because of the experiences you've had, good or bad. Um, I think uh, it, it was asked, like, you know, uh, that somebody failed uh, creating a light bulb a thousand times. And, uh, there was, and, and then succeeded eventually. The response was, no, I learned thousand ways of not creating a thousand light bulb and one way of how to make it. So um, it, it's, it's simply that it, you know, when, you, when you are stressed, when things all seem doom and gloom, look, you might have not prepared enough to do really well for the GCSEs this year or for the A-levels this year or maybe for, for whatever it is. But if you study really hard now, it works. Um, I, I was going to come to this eventually. I've got it within my notes here. Uh, a, a wise person at one point told me, look, your brain is like your muscle. Uh, so uh, if we were to go to the gym today and uh, we work on our muscles, I lift 10 kg and you lift 15 kg. If, you stop, if he stops going, the one who carries 15 kg, and I keep going for the next year and come back, then I can do 20 kg next year this time, but he's still going to do 15 or maybe less. And your brain is exactly the same. The more you use your brain, the more you challenge your brain, the more you uh, try to solve hard and difficult uh, problems, the more your brain can adapt and become smarter. So your brain is very much like your muscle. You need to do the exercises. So if you are doing your GCSEs or you're doing your A-levels or you're in second year university or third year even university, and you're not doing so great this semester or this time, it doesn't matter because if you train your brain, if you exercise your brain, then your brain is going to get smarter in the next task. 
even if it's not within academia, you're still going to get smarter and you're going to get better at doing it. So therefore, always don't don't be, don't lose hope. Keep keep at it, and and the, the more you challenge yourself, the the higher you uh, you're going to go. So uh, we're going back to the school thing. Um, yeah, let me just uh, give you a little little bit of a. I I read this book uh, called Choose uh, Choose Yourself by De James Altucher. Yeah? And one of the exercises he gives in that book is uh, about, uh, he's got a daily discipline of writing down 10 ideas a day. So it could be about any topic whatsoever. Every day you write down 10 ideas, write down 10 ideas. So I kind of did that for about six months where every day I was writing down 10 ideas, you know. And it could be any topic, it doesn't matter. Well, the idea is to exercise your idea muscle in your brain. If you keep doing it, you keep coming up with loads and loads of ideas and it, it, and it works like magic. And then I stopped doing it for a while and I thought, oh, you know, I'll, then I sat down and thought, oh, let me write down 10 ways of doing this, some uh, particular task. And I could think of two or three and then my brain started, you know, it had to kind of work really, really hard to come up with any further ideas. And then I thought I better get back into this yeah, and come up with uh, you know, at least 10 ideas about any particular topic, 10 ideas of how to set up a business or 10 ideas of how to improve your study technique. So it could be anything. And now I do it regularly. Whenever I get some task at work, I say, okay, let me think of 10 ideas and how we can increase our international recruitment. And I always come up with all these ideas very easily because the muscle is being conditioned. Exactly. It, it, exa so, it's exactly like that. Um, another thing that I was told, and this is very, very important, uh, and I found it to be kind of you know, uh, one of the essence of, of getting where you want to be, is that um, have a goal in mind and focus on that goal. Uh, somebody explained it to me like uh, driving a motorcycle. Wherever you look as you drive a motorcycle, that's where the motorcycle will head to. So if I, when, I, when I came to the UK and, and initially I wanted to do medicine and become a, a, a medical doctor. Uh, so my focus and my aim was there. When I did my GCSEs, I got um, one A star and, and uh, five Cs. That wasn't great to get me to med school. And then um, I tried to do my A levels. I had lots of baggage from you know torture and prison and so forth. I wasn't doing so great, uh, but I didn't give up because I kept saying like, I'm gonna go and do, uh, go into med school. Uh, so what I did, I did an access course uh, after that, you know, with, with, but, but the, 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 the thing that stayed with me is that I want to get into med school. doesn't matter how many years it takes, doesn't matter whether it's through A-levels or access course or whether I'm going to, and I did do, uh, redo my GCSEs to, to get the A's to get me into med school. So I, I had five C's from when I left school, but I did do uh, English and maths again to get my A's. So, uh, the, the, the idea is that if you have a goal in mind that this is where I want to go, but truly believe in it and truly work for that, yes, you know, you're going to fail an exam. Yes, you will fail a course, but there's another course. Oh, you can repeat that very course again. So there's always chance to do it and to get there. Uh, and, and, and on grand scheme of things, one year or two year getting you know, behind and delayed doesn't really make all that great of a difference when you consider the, the, the grand scheme of things. So, you know, have a goal, stick to that one goal that you have in mind that I want to get there. Um, so when I, went, I went to, I did go to med school. I eventually got um, three unconditional offers and one conditional offer, uh, which is quite rare to get uh, three unconditional offers out of four uh, when you apply to med school, but I did go, get that. And I decided to go to Aberdeen. Uh, I went to Aberdeen and I realized that though I wanted to do medicine, but it isn't really what I wanted to do ultimately. I've got my, you know, I've got numerous reasons, but I don't want to discuss those because I don't want to discourage somebody else who's going to make a great doctor. Um, so I decided to go into something that I actually loved doing and, and it was a hobby. It wasn't just something that I wanted to do uh, for the money or for the fame or name. No, it's something that I truly enjoyed. So I went into med, then into computer science. And, and hacking in particular. So I've got a degree in ethical hacking and network security. I did graduate top of my cohort. I did graduate with a first class degree. 
and I, I enjoyed it. I still enjoy it. I usually when I explain it to people when they tell me what you do, how do you find your field, I say, look, if you're David Beckham and you're playing football, and I'm not saying I'm as good as David Beckham when it comes to computer science, by no means I'm claiming that. But I'm saying if you're David Beckham and you enjoy playing football, and there is no restraint on, like, you know, as you get older, you, your stamina and your physique might not stay the same. No, with this field, the older you get, the more you stay in the field, the better you become. So this is, this is me practicing my hobby and getting paid for it. Uh, that's, that's what it is like. So when, but that being said, when I went to, uh, when I did my bachelor's degree, my undergrad degree, and my, uh, I remember that's when I decided that I wanted to go into Oxford because I, I transferred to computer science, but in computer science, I said, I'm going to do my PhD at Oxford. And um, at the time I, well, as soon as I uh, finished my undergrad, I uh, go into master's. I had a good offer from Manchester University because I started my, my master's at Manchester University. But then I realized what they were teaching at master's level was things that I already knew. So I went and had a discussion with the director of the course saying, look, you know, uh, you know what you're teaching here, I already know it, most of it if not all of it. So what else do you have to offer before I make a decision whether I'm going to stay here or leave? This is like week two. So she had a discussion with me and she kind of tested my knowledge in terms of cryptography and, and, and security. And she was quite impressed with how much I knew in that regards. So she offered me a fully funded PhD without a master, doing the master's at Manchester University. This is when I went to Professor Waka and I said, look, I've I want to go and do my PhD at Oxford, but I've been offered this opportunity uh, to, to do it here. And it's a fully funded PhD from Manchester University. What do you think? And it was you who told me, look, if you, if you really want to get to Oxford, stick to that and, and just get on with the master's for now, uh, which I, I listened to your advice and I'm very, very, very grateful for that advice. It basically changed a lot of things in my life because at that time it was very tempting for me for a moment to say, okay, you know what? They're going to pay me 16,000 a year to do a PhD rather than me paying them 3,000 at the time. Uh, rather than me paying them 3,000, they're going to pay me 16,000 and I'm going to get PhD, not just a master's. So just go do this. But it was Professor Waka who told me, you know, stick to it. And um, I called back my uh, lecturer or my supervisor actually uh, from Coventry. I said, look, I'm not happy with Manchester. What do you think? He said, well, if you come back here, we'll take you as an intern. You'll pay less and we'll, you'll be paid for being an intern and the, the, what we teach in here are different. So I stuck to that and I did this. Um, so, so and, and I'm glad I did. Uh, so I remember going back to the um, uh, course coordinator at Manchester University telling me, look, so have you decided? I said, yes. So she said, goes, what, what are you going to do? I said, well, I've said that I'm not going to do PhD anywhere but Oxford. So um, no, thank you very much for the offer. I'm really grateful that, um, no, I'm going to stick to masters. I'm going to go do it somewhere else where they teach in or I'm, I'm, can, I can learn something else, even though that at the time it was not as reputable. I don't think even this today as, as ranking of universities go, but I'm going to go there because I'm going to learn something new. Um, I'm glad that I did because I mean, then I learned new things. And again, I graduated with, with the uh, distinction uh, from a master's. Uh, so coming to Oxford um, and, and how it all started, um, so, so I was, as I said earlier, I was speaking to this admin from Oxford University and they said something really interesting. And that was, well, I said it as a joke, but then I thought, actually, no, it's not a joke. It's, it's the truth. So statistically, 100% of those who don't apply don't get in. So that is, that is, that is no joke. That's actually what it is. Like if you don't apply to get into Oxford, you are not going to get in. So regardless of what you think of yourself, apply. That is the first step. So that's a big tip that all those who don't apply don't get in. So if you think you want to go there, apply. You never know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, there's, quite a few there's quite a few young people listening. So I'd just like to invite them to either uh, uh, unmute their camera, uh, unmute and uh, put their cameras and ask questions and we can take them as we go along. Uh, there's a few. Uh, could you discuss the advantages and disadvantages of integrated masters? 
Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert in that field to, to kind of, I, pro I think Professor Oka would be probably a far more suited to, to kind of answer that, like in terms of integrated masters. Um, I'm simply kind of sharing my experience and how I go into Oxford and some tips on it, like on, on what does it take to get into Oxford. And um, I, I really appreciate the question, don't get me wrong. I, I just think Professor Oka is far, far better uh, kind of suited to answer that one uh, than me because I'm nowhere near uh, the experience that he's got. Uh, okay, let's, a, let's, let's maybe we'll listen to him how he got, got into Oxford and then, and then maybe questions will come in. Oh, no, no, so, sorry. So, 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 okay. so what was the experience like going to, you know, you've been to lots of other universities. To be, to be and, perfectly uh, honest, like even though... Oxford, how is it different? It, it's a whole different world. But before I come to the, like, how it's a whole different world, I want to say, like, me applying for Oxford, even though I had first class degree with distinction and I had a master's with distinction and I had what was equivalent to five straight A's from A-levels and five straight A's from GCSEs eventually, like, when I read it and we saw all the thing, I was still doubting whether I'm going to get into Oxford or not because, you know, the, the name was somewhat kind of scary. Uh, so, so I, the name was scary. Um, when I applied, uh, I heard that there was a, the, like I read on the news, there was a, um, a fully funded PhD after Snowden revelations, there was a fully funded PhD got offered by Oxford in cybersecurity, which was basically what I wanted. But I still was fearful to apply because, you know, we all are afraid of rejection be it rejection from a course, a rejection from a girl, for rejection from a man, whatever it is, a rejection is scary. And I was scared to kind of go for it. Um, but then I was working in Iraq at the time. I was heading a, a, a e-campus project that was, the budget was $30 million, which was my biggest project that I've managed. Actually, even today, I haven't got another project that big so far. Um, and I thought, you know what? And, and, I, and as that project ended, I got into a car crash. And the people I was working here, it was very difficult for me to say, look guys, I want to leave you guys and I want to do something different. It wasn't easy. So, and I thought, you know what, actually I'm gonna apply for that pro default. I'm not gonna get in, but I'm gonna apply anyways. And that was my, my thing. I did not, I genuinely didn't think I was going to get in uh, because I thought I've graduated from Coventry. There's no way they're gonna get me, even though I've graduated to the top of my cohort in my master's and my bachelor's. But no way Coventry is going to make it uh, to, to Oxford. And I was really, really surprised that, uh, you know, they said, okay, you've got an interview when I applied. So, so uh, regardless of what you think, uh, you know, how, how, uh, how good or bad you think you are, just apply. You never know what the outcome is going to be. I genuinely went out. What was the interview like? And what kind of questions did they ask? And, uh, um, to be honest, when I went to, when I went for the interview, it was uh, mainly, uh, so, so interviews from my experience and from what I've read is an opportunity for you to tell them not to accept you because the fact that they've asked you to go for an interview, that means you fit all the, you, you tick all the boxes to get in. But this is an opportunity for you to convince them not to accept you. That's, that's how I look at interviews. That's what I've read from somewhere. And that's how I look at them personally. And interview, it's, it's an opportunity for you to convince them not to take you in. Otherwise, they wouldn't call you in because if they call you in, that means you take all the right boxes and whether you're going to convince them otherwise or not, it's, it's up to you. And um, the other thing, I, my strategy for interviews, which I I'm, I'm tend to be like quite good at interviews, that's why I'm saying like, you know, I got uh, three unconditional offers from my med school and one conditional offer uh, when I applied for four medical schools. It's purely for the interviews because when I went for the interviews, it's I, I make it more about them rather than about me. I don't uh, ask people to grill me about what I know. I, I kind of turn around the question. Uh, I will come to all the questions in a minute. Sorry, but but I don't. I turn around the question and I I usually ask whoever it is that is interviewing me. I ask them like, what is it that they are looking for, so I can tell them whether I have that or not. So I asked them specifically, you know, tell me what is it that you, rather than me talking about absolutely everything and, and going off topic, how about you tell me what is it that you're precisely looking for? And I can give you my experiences and my, my skills that fit that so that you can rest assured that I do fit the criteria that you're looking for. 
So that's how I do it. So when I went for the interview, again, um, the other thing I did for my interview is that I researched all the people that I knew thought that were going to be interviewing me. I researched their background, their research background, their academia, to a point that I actually knew someone's dog name. I knew his dog's name, and I knew that he liked the Scotch pipe to, to play. Uh, I basically knew everything about him. So I did my research. I did my research inside out. I think I, I, got, I knew stuff about them that they have forgotten that they've got. Uh, I remember one of, one, one, one of the guys who was not, did not interview me, but he was one of the interviews that interviewed other candidates. Uh, I let him meet him and I said to him like, look, he said, what can you find out about me? It was, it was a bit of an exercise. And I said, well, I don't need to find out because I already know things about you. And he goes, what do you know? I said, well, you're a blogger and you're, you know, you, you're religious from that kind of a thing and you blog about religion. He's like, no, no, but I've deleted all those. I said, yeah, but there's archive.org. I went and looked it up on archive.org before I applied here because I thought you were going to be my interviewee. So I thought I should find this out about you. It's like, wow. So I did, I did do my research. I, whatever job I apply for, whatever position or uh, academic thing I apply for, I research it out like there's no, like my life depends on it. Like if I get one question wrong, I'm gonna get hanged. And that's how I research it. Like I get to know it inside out. I, I, I knew the guy's dog's name. I knew his pet name. I knew his siblings. Uh, I, I basically, uh, this is other than the research and, and the th papers that I had read. Uh, maybe it's to do with my hacking background because one of the, uh, the first step for uh, a hacking or penetration testing is information gathering. So you need to find absolutely everything about the target that you want to hack. And that's how I go on about things. So I did do that. Um, just, just to kind of come, come, come to these questions here. Uh, in terms of like the integrated masters, I'm really not an expert to say that. So I'll leave that to uh, Professor Ocas and Paul Torres. But um, of opportunities, no, to be honest, like to say that at the moment I'm working in Iraq, I'm working in Kurdistan, just to, to kind of be clear about this. And even here, let alone in the UK, even here, if, if I was from some other university in the UK, I wouldn't have got the opportunities that I'm getting at the moment and the ones that I've got already. Uh, for one here, you need to have a political alliance to a political party to be able to get anything done generally. I'm very loud about not having any political alliance. And yet I'm, I'm, I'm in contact with very high people very, in, in very high position and I'm getting projects done. I'm happy to talk about the projects I'm doing now. I, if, you, if you guys would like me to talk about those as well. So I'm getting projects and that kind of mesmerizes people. How did I get these people to accept this? And these doors are opening to me simply because of the word Oxford. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not saying anything, but that's what it is. Uh, you know, people are more willing to listen to me, more willing to uh, open doors for me. Uh, simply because I've got the word Oxford attached to me. Uh, I don't, to be perfectly honest, I don't like the world working this way. I like equality and equity everywhere, but it, I, I also do realize this is not how the world, how the world works. Uh, so no. Let me, ask you, have, let me ask you another question. Yeah. One of my friend's daughters, uh, she went to Cambridge to study medicine. So when she was at school, right since when she was a little girl, she always came on top of her class. So she always top, top, top. Then she got 11 A stars for GCSE. She got five A's, A's for her A-levels. Yeah, they do use some A stars then. And then when she went into Cambridge, uh, she found it very, very difficult because everybody in the class, they've all got A stars. They've all been very, very top. And, that, and I said to her, how did you cope emotionally coming bottom? And I said, what happened when you started? She said, well, when I started, I came bottom of the class and it actually really hurts your ego. So I'm just wondering, how did you cope with that gap in uh, oh, I, I did cope. I did not cope. I, I felt like an imposter. Uh, actually, it's got a name. It's called imposter syndrome. Uh, I mean, the, the audience can actually look it up on Google and Google Scholar. There are quite a few uh, academic papers about imposter syndrome. I felt like an imposter uh, to a point that I my first paper that I published, I was really scared that I'm going to be discovered that uh, I'm a fraud in Oxford. I'm not that good. And my supervisor is going to realize that I'm really, really bad, but they just hasn't realized. And as soon as they see my first paper, this is when I'm going to be discovered. 
So before I get discovered, I thought, you know what, I better give in myself and, and you know, hand myself over to the authorities. So I sent an email to my supervisor telling, look, I don't think you accepting me here was the right decision. I don't think I'm good enough to be in Oxford. I've written this paper and I've deleted, and literally did, actually wrote the paper and deleted it four times. And I re started from fresh, uh, the whole paper. And then I said, look, I've written this paper four times, but I'm worried that I'm gonna send it to you. And then you realize how bad and how poorly it is. And uh, you're gonna regret having taken one as a student, let alone accepting me at the university. So, uh, and I'm not sure what to do. So how about I call it quits? And, and he was ever so generous and kind. And he's one of the best people I've met in my life. One of the best people I've met in my life. And um, he sent a really, really kind email back saying, look, you know, I'm not here to judge you. And if you did, if you were not good enough, you wouldn't be accepted here. But this is a very common feeling. Every, if you look around, everyone around you is going to have that feeling every so often because everyone in Oxford works at a, such a high, everyone's in such a high caliber, it's such a high level in, of intellect. And that field, you will always find somebody who's smarter than you in one area, whereby you are smarter than them in another area, but you're going to find another six people who are smarter than you in six other areas. So you will always feel like you know you are behind others, because yes, you may very well be very good in one thing, but there's seven other areas that you need to be good at. And but these seven other areas, there are seven other people who are smarter than you. So that the imposter syndrome is there. I mean, it's it's throughout the university. It's always there. Everybody's feeling it. Everyone is feeling that you know they 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 cheat their way. They they fooled people to get in because they're not good enough to get in. Uh, to be perfectly honest. I don't think that feeling ever went away. I, I always thought, you know what? And, and to be honest, my, my, my supervisor told me, said, look, you know, that feeling, even if it goes away, it's gonna come back and then go away and come back. And he was absolutely spot on. That feeling does come and go. You, know, you always feel like, oh, you know what? Oxford is such a this, or Cambridge is such a this, or, or academia is such a this, or university is such a this. I'm, you know, people think I'm there, but I'm not really there. That is a common feeling. You, you will have this all the time, even now and away from Oxford. I've been given several projects here that are very, very kind of big. Uh, I'm working on at least four projects now that are very big. And I'm still thinking like the guys who've given me this project within the government of, have overestimated my capabilities. I still have that feeling because I always know how much there is to do in any field. I know. I, I don't know how much I know, but I do know how much more there is for me to know in, in the field of computer science. So that feeling, to be perfectly honest, I don't think it ever goes away. I'm always on my toes to make sure that I am trying to catch up with, with all the stuff that I don't know, but it's a lot, it's humongous that what I don't know. So that feeling is always there. The feeling that, uh, and the fact that, you know, in one exam you get a good grade, or seven other exams, you're not top of the class anymore. You're bottom of the class because the other guys are so good at this and, and they're so much better than you. And, and that's a fact that you have to live on with. But, but the fact that you get in, you get in because you have the capability, you have the right grades, you have the right things. So on one side, you've got, on one side, you've got like uh, you thinking, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. On the other side, wherever you go, Everybody says, oh, you must be really clever because you went to Oxford. Oh, you must be a genius. You must be great. You must be fantastic. How do you kind of balance these opposing views? Um, well, you, you don't really balance. I mean, the way you balance them, you, you know yourself. And uh, to be honest, when I went and did my bachelor's degree, uh, because I was in the hacking scene and I was in the security scene for quite some time, I was, I was interested in computer security from like ever since I got to the UK, which is 1999. I, I was very overconfident you know, in my capabilities. I thought I knew it all. And the more I got to know it, and the more I go into it, the more I realized, actually, you know, there's so much more for me to learn. Now I'm at the point, even with a PhD, I'm thinking like, no, there is so much more for me to learn. So I don't think, you know, when I go to places and say, oh, you're from Oxford, it actually scares me rather than give me confidence. When they say you're from Oxford, I'm thinking like, oh, they, they expect so much from me, but I'm really nowhere near that because I know how much more there is for me to know, and I don't actually know it. So it's, it's quite the opposite. I don't, I mean, I was very overconfident when I was in my twenties, especially I knew what I could do, you know? I, I mean, my brother, I think he's in the audience here. I would, I would have fun with him from time to time with his permission, nothing illegal. With his permission, I would go into his computer, open up his 
CD room closed the up and then go to them every other day saying, look, I found out your new password. This is your new password. I mean, we were playing like brothers. We were playing, we were having fun and he knew it was totally legitimate what I was doing. But I was really overconfident in what I could do. I could write a virus in an evening and, and uh, get the hard drive to spin so fast that I would actually physically make us, you know, have smoke coming out of it. I was, I was, I was overconfident in what I knew, but this is when, before doing my bachelor's, and as I doing my bachelor's, I was even more confident in what I knew. But as I got to know more, I learned there is so much more for me to know, and that I know so very little, to a point where I, like, you know, now if somebody tells me, like, oh, you know a lot, and in my immediate response would be like, no, actually, I, I, I know very, very little, because that is the truth. And I, only, I, I genuinely only know that there is so much more for me to know. From that regard, so I don't think I get overconfident when people say, "Oh, you're from Oxford." Like, "Oh yeah, I know it all." No, that's not the case. Um, but 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 that is uh, that is something that I think it partially that kind of was kind of hardened or or, or or engraved in me when I went to Oxford, when I would have discussions with people, uh, thinking that, "Oh, I'm an expert in this. I know this inside out." And then all of a sudden I would speak two words and the person opposes it to me would kind of say 10 more things that made a lot more sense than what I was saying. And then I would, for instance, I would say, you know, this buffer overflow is like this, this kind of vulnerability in, in code is like this. And the other person would find 10 smarter ways than what I had said to fix that. Like, oh, oh, I really don't know much about this, do I? Uh, so maybe that is part of whatever the experience that I got from Oxford. Like everybody's so smart. If yeah. you went back, if you went back a few years, we've got lots of youngsters listening whose ambition is to get into these prestigious universities. If you went back a few years, other than hard work and setting a goal or a target, what advice would you give the youngsters now or your younger version of yourself? To be, to be perfectly honest, I would, I would be more focused, uh, spend less time gaming, spend less time uh, chatting to girls, if I'm utterly honest, and be more focused. The thing is like every, everything, um, everything you do, time is money. So I, I was very careless with my time early on. And, and now I realize how important time is. I mean, I could have been far ahead in my career and academia right now if I had been a little bit more cautious with how I spend my time. Uh, but you know, that's 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 the honest truth. If I was to look back then, timing, I was very careless with it. It's like you had lots of money in your pocket and you just wasted it uh, on nothing. And uh, it's a money that you can't get back. Time is something that you can't get back. So that's the. But the other thing would be definitely like hard work. You know, work harder and harder every day. You know, uh, in the tomorrow me doesn't know something that I didn't know today. And tomorrow me is a loser because he spent the day, lost the day, and did not learn something new. So that is really, really important, I think. And then, you know, having a clear goal that where you want to go, have that narrow tunnel vision to where you want to go, regardless. Yes, life will throw you about, will kick you around, will throw, you know, will get you down on your knees. But if you have that narrow vision, as you get back up, you will walk towards that light or that, that tunnel, and you're not going to get sidetracked too much. So that's the thing. Uh, so yeah, a lot of uh, us, when we give advice to our uh, children, we want them to have like a good uh, career and a prestigious career. So we say to our kids, you know, when they're small, uh, when you grow up, yeah, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be... Um, that, that, that was it. You know, our, maybe the community we live in, they say, well, when you grow up, yeah, follow your passion, follow what you, your heart says. How, what advice um, so, 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 yeah, so, yeah, so I, I grew up in a family that they all told me, look, you know, you're smart enough, you know, go to, go do medicine, go do medicine, you should do medicine. Our son is going to become a doctor. He's going to become a medical doctor. He's going to become a surgeon. And you know what? I, I, it got into my head. I was like, yeah, yes, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And I wanted to have, please my mom. That is the honest truth. I went to med school to make my mom happy. Uh, in fact, I got married to make my mom happy too, if I'm utterly honest. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that I made my mom happy for the marriage thing. I'm not so happy for the medicine thing, to be perfectly honest. Um, but no, I, 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 did, I did go to medicine to make my mom happy too. So she can go and sit in, in gatherings and say, oh, my son is a medical doctor and he's a surgeon. 
but the moment I went there, I realized it wasn't for me for multiple reasons that I don't want to go into now. Simply because I don't want to encourage other people. Otherwise, I'm very happy to talk about them. Uh, so, so as soon as I went to med school, I realized it wasn't for me. So this is the time that I wasted. That I, I spent a lot of years trying to get into med school, whereby I could have easily spent it on, on, on getting into uh, the, the computer science and security in particular, that what I actually loved because you know, I, I shine there, I, you know, I enjoy it. The more books I read, the more I enjoy it. It's not, I don't see it as a chore or as, as, as anything difficult. So why did I go into Oxford, uh, Ali? Well, I, I go into Oxford because I knew Oxford would open doors for me and uh, I knew it was going to be challenging. I do have a motto that I live by. I always try to be working with those who are smarter than me because even if I'm not the smartest in the room, when I'm competing with the smartest people, it pushes me. If I'm working with people who are not as smart as I am or as good as I am or as powerful or strong as I am when I'm at the gym, that means I'm going to, I can easily become overconfident in some ways and I lag like behind. So it's always better to, to run with those who run faster than you. That means you're going to push yourself to run faster. But if you run with people who run slower than you, then you don't really have all that motivation to push yourself to go, you know, to go faster. So that's that's one of the reasons. The other reasons I knew all open doors for me, and I was, you know, spot on. Uh, yeah, the application process was different to get into Oxford. Uh, uh, always, uh, you know, other than the online forms that you have to fill in and, and you know the fee that you have to pay, there's always an interview. Uh, I don't think there is a part where there's no interview. There's always an interview, and. Um, and what does it take? So, so this is this is something that I wanted to kind of focus on. On what does it take to get into Oxford? To be honest, and that is, look, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, they are they are all under humongous amount of pressure to be more diverse, and they actively making an effort to be more diverse, to take people on from poor backgrounds, from public schools. They are, they, they genuinely the will is there, the the effort is there. But the truth is, end of the day, they will they will only take on people that are exceptional. So, so other than the grades that you need to have, you need to work for the grades. And you know, as I said, like don't worry if you didn't get the grades when you left school. You always have opportunity to redo your GCSEs. Don't worry if you didn't get the right A levels. You can redo A levels, or you can do do an access course to get the right grades on the right level. You know, there's always an opportunity. So. That is crucial. You know, I cannot lie to you and say, hey, look, grades doesn't really matter, you know, so long as, no, no, you need the grades. So work for the grades, because uh, from outside, when they look at you, this is the first thing that they, they look at. You know, if you don't have the grades, then they, they will stroke you off. Uh, more importantly than that, like once, once we put that away, more importantly is experience. You know, you need like, if you're doing, if you're talking post-grad, then you need experience. You know, the more experience you have, the, the more likely for you to be accepted. When we talk in undergrad, Oxford gets thousands of applications of, from smart people with the right grades to get into Oxford, but not all of them get into Oxford. That's simply because they're looking for something unique about you, something special to you. What do you bring to the university? Because, you know, You've got 10 people, they all got A's and they've all got uh, you know, the right subjects. But what makes one more preferable than the other is what's very unique about them. Um, something, when I filled up my form, this is another technique that I use or another approach that I have when it comes to filling forms or approaching this is that um, there is never an optional box on any form. A box may say optional, but it's not optional. It's always a compulsory box. It's never an optional box. Because if two people fill up their forms, one of them, and they have exactly the same qualification, they have exactly the same thing. One of them went and put in the effort to fill up the optional boxes and use that to sell its skills and its education better. And the other one thought, I don't need this. The one who sold themselves better in terms of uh, highlighted their, their skills and their suitability for that position or for that um, job, 
they will get it the other. So, so no box in any form is ever ex like optional. Every single box is compulsory. I even have the tendency to go and attach, if I get, get the opportunity to do that, I usually go and write a whole another page and attach it to it saying, and I've got this supplementary page there, please read that too if you've got the time. Uh, so, so no, so, so this, is, this is something else. So what, what does it take to get in? Other than the grades, you need to be unique. You need to bring something more to the table. Um, I've always been interested in like, no, there's a question you write, so I'm not about being given the right, so I'm gonna go there. So, so but, but I've always aimed to finish my education that I come back here to help the system here. I am very grateful to the UK and the UK system that got me the education and helped me to get to where I am. But I always have felt like if I had stayed in the UK, I would improve things ever so slightly, whereby if I'm working in Iraq or say elsewhere in the third world countries or developing countries, then I'll have an opportunity to have a bigger footprint and, and, and make much more difference in the world. So that has been my, my goal in general. And um, I, th I believe I said that in the interview, uh, one of the professors that was there told me, yeah, but we can give you a funded PhD. We can spend all this money on you. Do you think it's fair on taxpayers for you to go and work abroad? And I said, uh, and my response was, look, you know, I, I don't believe in belonging to a particular place or part of the world or race or uh, I, I believe in humanity. I believe in that, you know, wherever I am, so long as I'm improving, you know, the, the people's life, it's, it's, it's what matters. And, and they were very happy with my response. I mean, this was their, them questioning me to see whether, like, I think this is where my uniqueness came in when they decided, like, if this is the guy we want to take on, it's, you know, what's so unique about you? I remember even in my med school when I went to Manchester University and I did my interview. By the way, they were the only one who gave me a conditional offer. Uh, but when I went to Manchester University and I did my interview for med school, they, the question was, uh, look, you know, if you were to kind of, at the, at the time, Syria was a peaceful place. They said, that if we were to advertise in Syria, try to advertise about breast milk or powder milk and say, you know, do breast milk. How would you go on about this? And my honest response to them at the time was, look, if I'm going to go and um, do this, if I'm going to go to, uh, I don't need to, I said, if you want, I, I said, there's a standard response that you expect from me. I can give you that, or I can tell you the real response. They said, well, go with the real one. I said, no, I'll tell you the standard, then I'll give you the real. I said, the standard is I'm going to go with education, advertisement, and all that. I said, but the real response is I'm not going to do anything. Uh, they were like, what do you mean? I said, well, people have much more bigger problems in Syria than, than figuring out which one. And if they have the money, they're probably going to spend it on some food or something else rather than powder milk if the mother can breastfeed. So I don't think I'd need to do anything there. And this is the real truth. And they were very impressed with my answer. So, uh, and again, with, with the answer that I got from the interview in Oxford. So I, in my experience, any of these places, any of these places that are hard fought and everybody gets the right grades to get into, like, you know, with med school, you do you did need three A's at the time. Uh, so if you got the right grades, other than the right grades, they need something special about you, something unique about you. So, so find that. I know I'm actually, I'm, I'm based in Iraq, Nasser, and Nasser, and uh, it's, it's not a short mission. I'm, I'm planning to be here for as long as it takes. And if at one point I realize Iraq is doing really well and becoming something like Dubai and Saudi Arabia, I'll probably find myself in somewhere like Egypt or something like that. That's my uh, uh, ways. Yes, definitely doing an undergraduate in Oxford is definitely worth it. It's going to open up doors for you. It's going to make it easier for you to get a job. It's going to make it easier for you to excel in a, like in your in your academic or, or you know career. Uh, so yes, definitely uh, it, it helps a lot. Uh, video games and I didn't get hard to manage both school and being at it. And then with our series and I should keep in. No, look, um, you like video games and you like school. Uh, to be honest, you can manage them. It's, it's not easy. The way I would say try to do them, as I said, your brain needs exercise. Don't ever kind of give up on the on one, because this is what I was saying earlier on. Uh, Sharjeev, 
uh, don't give up on one because your brain always needs exercise. Your brain always needs to be challenged for you to improve as a person, regardless. So, uh, so, so, so keep on, keep on at, at school and keep on with the games. The way I manage it, because I'm, I'm, I love gaming. I even right now, uh, I, I still do gaming. I still do PUBG, by the way. And, and if, if you're doing PUBG, I would let you know my KD is seven. Uh, so I'm, I'm still with games. I'm still, I, I still enjoy them a lot. I still follow Naruto and Bleach and One Punch and these guys in terms of uh, animes and mangas and so forth. I'm, I'm that kind of person. Um, I mean, I went to Kellogg uh, as far as college go. Um, so, so yeah, so, so you can manage. The way I did it myself, I would, I would, I would even self-diagnose here yeah, and say I'm, I've got addiction to games. But the way I do it is that I reward myself with the game. So I, I tell myself if I get X, Y, and Z done, then I'm going to play this many hours games today. And I do that even now. Even now I've got projects with the Ministry of Interior, with, whereby the Minister of Interior is expecting me to deliver something. And I tell myself, as soon as I'm done this particular function within that system, then I'm going to go and play all night doing PUBG. So, uh, and I'm not telling anybody, go and do these games. But if you're somebody who can't stay away, use it as a reward system. You know, refrain myself, like restrain yourself from doing something unless you've done X, Y, and Z. Like, unless you finish your math puzzles, don't, don't do games today. Make it your kind of, you know, reward. So that's, that's, that's how I manage, manage them both. Uh, yeah, I'm from Kellogg. Uh, can you give me an example of trades that is actually that you know? So apart from work, you can be uh, Oh yeah, so the other thing, the other thing about Oxford that is very. Um, uh, so so uh, so the 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 trades in Oxford. The other thing about Oxford that is very unique to Oxford is that. You, I, I went to Oxford, uh, and I'm the kind of guy, to be honest, that works really hard before the exams, and uh, other times I'm doing 10 other things. Uh, so uh, one of the very unique things about it is that you have no idea how do they get you to be so focused in the science that you work in. So they have various activities that goes on, at, at least at postgraduate level. And that is like, we had game nights in Oxford, whereby they, they, we would gather up to, you know, play games and, you know, hopefully talk about research. We had dinners uh, that, that the old university would organize for us between, like, say, geography and computer science or law and history. Uh, they would provide us with food, uh, you know, and but but with the hope, not with the condition, but with the hope that we will discuss in kind of uh, collaborative research between multidisciplinary research and so forth. Uh, we had movie nights whereby a professor would come and sit with us with a cohort and they would bring us food as well. They would order us some like Pizza Hut or some, some other curries or whatever. And then at the end of the movie, collectively, we spent 10 minutes discussing the movie and relating it to our field. Uh, not each person, each individual who watched the movie, but collectively as a group. And the professor would basically direct or guide how the conversational discussion went. So, so these are things about Oxford and like the other stuff, you know, you've got sports. I mean, my college, Kellogg, for instance, like every year, we had a week whereby they would bring in a masseuse and we book a, a session to get a massage. Uh, so there were these tiny things. I mean, you get um, uh, punting, like we had, the college had a punt that you could go and hire and go and relax and so forth. One thing I really love about Oxford is how relaxing it is. The other thing is, Everyone is there to help you. Like the, 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 well, at least my experiences, I'm not sure, like I can't speak for the university throughout, but I got this sensation that it's throughout. Everyone is there to help you. Everyone is there to push you forward. Everyone is there to, and everyone's so humble, regardless of what people say. All the people that I interacted were, with were very humble, were very eager to help you and keen to help you to get to where you want to be. Um, they were not, I mean, uh, compared to some other universities who tried to be prestigious uh, without pointing finger at anyone, they were very much like the previous ones, were very much like military, like you have to be here at that time. But in Oxford, if you couldn't make it there at that time, they would be utterly understanding. I mean, I thought they would be a lot more rigid 
than the other universities. And that was very surprising to me that how flexible they were and how understanding they were. Uh, other universities, I mean, I in one of the universities, I go into a discussion or with one of the lecturers proving them wrong on a particular topic scientifically. And they took it really personally. Whereby in Oxford, um, week two, uh, couple of couple of us, we tried to do something with some of this. We found a vulnerability somewhere. And I went to supervisor tell them, look, you know, we found this vulnerability within the system here and there. And he was over the moon that we did that. You know, he was really impressed that we did that. And he told the appropriate people to fix it immediately. And they did fix it immediately. So, you know, you experimented, but it wasn't discouraged. It was encouraged to do. Whereby just to highlight uh, an issues elsewhere, uh, they, they took it on really personally and they were very far more rigid about it. So these are things about, so I really, really love that, how open everybody is, how open-minded they are, they, want, they were accepted. So yeah, so uh, one of the guys that sent me something in private saying like, you know, he's got similar thing. And yeah, so this is it. It's, uh, yeah, so this is it. So if, you, if you've got this, uh, but but one of the really really difficult courses to get into in Oxford is PPE. Uh, just 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 so that you know, it's one of the uh, that. Um, yeah, well, yes. Well, my kid is seven. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty old, by the way. I may not get the gray hairs. I've not got the gray hairs yourself, but I'm, I'm pretty old. Uh, so that's there. Uh, so yeah, so that's pretty much it. So if you've got any other questions about Oxford and the life in Oxford and whatnot, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, but that, that's my experience. That's how I go in there. This is what I think it takes to get in there. You need to have something special about you, something unique about you other than the grades. Uh, it's, it, and uh, one of the guys sent, it, sent a message in private telling me like, you know, I'd like, just like you, I'd like to help my people. And, and that, is, that is a very unique thing. Uh, you know, not many people are willing to give up the luxuries that you get in the UK. And I'm not saying it makes you, you know, it doesn't make you better or worse than people, but it's something that uh, people within Oxford are looking for. Uh, you know, it's something that they, they, they mm -hmm. want to do. So yeah, so as far as the social time, there is a lot of social time uh, in there. Like, as I said, you've got movie nights, you've got, um, and you've got formal dinners, you've got so much social time there, honestly, it's, it's incredible. But they all very well, very nicely crafted towards making you, making everything in your life to be about your field of science or your field and your knowledge. So even though uh, they seem like social activities, but somehow there is something in there that is gonna twist it around and make it for you to be, and I told my wife at one point saying, look, uh, well, I, I didn't actually live in the dorms. The dorms are very nice, uh, I live in, but I didn't actually live in the dorms because I had a family and so forth, so I preferred like private rent. Uh, they've got everything. They've got cricket, they've got rugby, uh, Dr. Nasser. I, I was playing MMA, I was playing mixed martial arts. Uh, I was, um, so Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and Taekwondo. So they've got absolute archery, punting, fencing. Um, there's, there are so many sports, like the sports facilities in Oxford are excellent. The kind of relaxation and, and, and other, like meditation, like you'd get, uh, there were so many mindfulness sessions going on in the college, in the university, in the department, in other colleges that they were actively advertising. There were so many yoga sessions going on within the university. It was incredible, to be honest. So, yes, there is there is a mosque that we we are having like it was, and it's next to Robert Hook Building on Parks Road. It's pretty big, and uh, there are Friday prayers, and every Friday they hold two sessions. And the Islamic Society within Oxford University, they are very, they're very brilliant, they're very active. Uh, to be honest, Ali, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it, but going in there as a family, you know, as I have my family and, and, and kids and so forth, I did do a job rather than pursuing something else. I did actually do a job outside of the university because while I did my PhD, my wife did her master's at KCL, King's College privately, so I had to kind of, you know, 
pay for for her studies and then have a house in London, have a house in Oxford, uh, and so much more. So yes, I was able to do a, a job, and but it made my life incredibly difficult. I wouldn't recommend you doing it, but there is room for doing it if it's something that you really want to do. So yeah, so. So, yeah, so, so the t as I said, teachers and stuff are really, really nice. In my experience, they are. I mean, obviously, this is very dependent on who you meet. But in my experience, they're in incredibly nice. Uh, in my college, like there's, 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 there's the college whereby they support you if you have any emotional, financial, or any other kind of issues. That, you know, there's always somebody that's your college advisor that you can go to. There's always a, a departmental advisor that you can go to. There's always a university advisor that you can go to. So there are so many points of you getting help from the university, be it from college, from be it from the department, be it from the university. The help is all over the place throughout the university, which is something I really, really good. Uh, so yeah, so that is that is really something that I was very different from other universities. Other universities they have support in place, but it's nowhere near as extensive and as widely spread and available as it is in Oxford. Maybe it's to do with how much money each one of them got, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, the only university that compares with excellent support is University of Lincoln. And my PhD students will argue with you. No doubt, no doubt, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so thank you for listening. I mean, that's basically pretty much all what I have to share about this. Yeah. But if there's any other questions that come up, I'm, you know, I'm more than happy to ask any direct questions. I think there are some youngsters um, who are watching this webinar now and who are actually preparing for uh, the interview for Oxford University. Um, maybe, I don't know, I think if Awes is there, if you can unmute and ask something. Um, he's, he's preparing, I think, in the middle of next month. They have, uh, and, and they're going through some some sample questions as well. So maybe if you want to ask a verse, if you're there, unmute and ask some questions. If he's there, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm here. Uh, no, I can't think of a question right now. Uh, I think I've got everything. If you were to give so, any, uh, so I'll, I'm I'm gonna just I'm just gonna send him my email in case if he's got anything uh, later on that comes up. Uh, if even if I don't know, like if I don't know the answer myself, I do know enough people from the admin staff and people who are involved in the interviewing uh, things so that you know I can put the question to them to get their opinion. So if there's anything that you have, I'll just send you my email in private so that you can by all means just send me, drop me an email. And I will be more than happy to respond. And this is my personal one. So I think we're coming towards the end of our time now. Uh, are there any, some, what would be the top three tips you would give as a parting advice to youngsters wanting to get into Oxford? Um, determination, be determined, have a, narrow vision when, when it comes about your goal or where you want to go to and what you want to do. So be determined. Train your brain just like you train your body, you know, just like going to the gym, go to the gym for your brain, you know, exercise with your brain. Uh, don't lose focus and never lose hope. There's always another path that takes you to Oxford. Even if you didn't get it from this way or that way, there's always another path that gets you there. So never, ever, ever lose hope. Uh, in my life, many times I've lost hope that I thought I was going to die, let alone not make it to Oxford. But I did not lose hope. I, I, I eventually, you know, succumbed those things. Um, don't lose hope. I, if I came to the UK, somebody as a, as an asylum seeker uh, that couldn't speak a word of English uh, at the age of sixteen, and uh, I was able to make it to Oxford, starting from scratch, starting fresh, starting from zero. Uh, in fact, when I came to the airport and I handed myself over to the authorities claiming asylum, I remember that I couldn't, I didn't know the word grey to tell the officer to, that the colour of the chairs of the airport that I was sitting on was grey. Uh, this is how bad my English was when I came to the UK. 
And yet I was able to make it to med school and I was able to make it not just to Oxford, but to get a fully funded PhD from Oxford University. Rather than pay the, the university to get a PhD, I, I was paid to do a default there or PhD there. So don't lose hope. There's always a chance. And if, if one path closes, just look for another because you will find another. Thank you. Uh, that was very uh, inspirational. Uh, thanks for all your time and effort. And thanks to all the listeners. I just want to remind you that this, this webinar was brought to you by Young Professional Society and STEM Matters, who were working uh, together jointly. And uh, I hope that you could share this talk with your colleagues and friends so that they can also have the insights uh, that you've just given. So that's for everybody. Visit our website, YPS and STEM Matters, and uh, you'll hear about or learn about lots of other things that are going on in, uh, in, this, uh, in this activities. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.